That's right. So obviously one of these kids is not like the other. Everybody else is is a super cool, highly, you know, engaging framework and and I am the author of a one of the authors of a, a library that deals with uh, asynchrony or sometimes synchrony, just like a, a primitive type uh, with some composition. So reactive programming. So this is the uh, kind of the state of the union with our JS5. Um, first thing that everyone should know is we are more popular than Angular. <laughs> um, it's, this is just, it's kind of a gag. You see that the line actually follows Angular. It's because we're Angular's only dependency, but I'll continue to bring this up because it's a fun fact. Um, so RxJS is, again, not like the other, the other uh, people that are speaking here who are mostly talking about frameworks. RxJS is a library full of uh, reactive programming primitives that you can use with anybody's framework. Uh, in fact, uh, Evan use uh, Evan U has a, a library that's an add-on for Vue that is built around using RxJS for state management. So it's you can use it with a lot of things. We use it with uh, both Ember and React at, at Netflix as well. Um, so the the plan for this quarter uh, with, for the RxJS team is is kind of steady as we go. Uh, I know at Netflix a lot of the uh, customer facing UI projects are starting to adopt the newer version of RxJS. In doing so, of course, we uncover bugs from time to time, and those bugs need to be fixed. So uh, a lot of this quarter with, with RxJS is really looking at um, kind of hardening the, this, this library. Not that it, it's not already really solid, but um, you know, there, I, we're starting to find more of the the corner case bugs, and, and we really like to iron those out before we go making any real drastic changes. Um, there is right right now is as far as interesting changes, and this this particular change will probably incur like a minor version increase uh, because it's a it's a new feature. I don't think that it's necessarily a breaking change, uh, which is the zones PR, which uh, Mishko put in maybe about a week ago. Uh, it's it's I'm mentioning it specifically because it's fun and controversial. <laughs> like so, a lot of the a lot of the folks that use RxJS are using Angular, and uh, this this PR is something that really helps them them out. Um, however, you know, a lot of folks folks on the uh, core team for RxJS uh, are not necessarily users of Angular, um, and a lot of reactive programmers in general aren't necessarily users of Angular. So. It's, it's really important that people go read through this PR and understand what it's about. It's nothing major. I'm actually for this PR. I think it's, I think it's something we're definitely going to get in. But uh, I thought I'd give this shout out because Mishko's on the, on the uh, podcast. And, um, you know, if we can just get more voices in there uh, <laughs> uh, saying what, what they like about it, what they don't like about it, um, it, I don't know. At the very least, it'll make that uh, pull request, the comments, more fun. Um, so the the one of the next huge things on our agenda for RxJS is the test suite. Currently, you can test uh, with RxJS with these things called marble diagrams, which are kind of like ASCII art um, representations of what happens in uh, in Observable. And we use that to run. Uh, I think it's like twenty five hundred tests now in for our RxJS library. Like, and it runs in a matter of like a second or two. Uh, and the, the idea behind the, this is that these ASCII art represent these ASCII art um, representations of the observable are really ASCII art representations of what happens over time. So it's like dashes is the passage of time, and then a value, and then uh, more dashes is the passage passage of time. And then you can run these things virtually. So meaning that some synchronous thing loops over an array of what's supposed to happen, and you can assert outcomes. And this works really, really well for RxJS, and it works really, really well for the, our library um, test suite in particular. However, uh, there are problems when it comes to um, dealing with real world, more real world scenarios. So outside of like where we're testing the, the library, when you go to test something in your, your app, uh, for one thing, the test the the test scheduler is not necessarily easy to use like ergonomically. You have to create a new test scheduler. You have to use methods on it. You have to call flush on it. Um, 
you have to pass it around everywhere that you're using any other scheduling. That's that's not the ideal. It's not very easy for for people to understand and use right now, um, unless they're experts with it. Uh, the the other thing is if people are using a specific scheduler by default deep within their code, maybe it's hidden by a closure. So they're using the RX ASAP scheduler, which is something that executes things in a micro task like a promise, or they're using you know the request animation frame scheduler uh, for doing animations that those those schedulers right now if 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 they're wrapped by a closure then are just using our test scheduler um, with whatever feeds into some observable that actually has those other schedulers in it isn't going to cause those other schedulers to uh, to suddenly be executed in virtual time like the like the test schedulers uh, test scheduler stuff does so that's that's problematic. That's problematic because it makes you're trying to get deterministic tests with a test scheduler, and you can't because you still have non-deterministic scheduling somewhere deep inside where you can't touch it. And the idea, and this comes from Jay Phelps, who who was working on some of this. Uh, the idea is that we can go through and kind of patch all of the existing test schedulers only while a test is going on to use the the uh, that virtualized test scheduler also. So uh, if you're using any other scheduler, it will just go through the test scheduler instead. Um, the, other, the other part of uh, productizing the test suite that is difficult is that it, right now, uh, those ASCII art marble diagrams are very nice uh, because you can say, OK, every dash is, represents the passage of about 10 milliseconds and then an event and so on. However, what happens if you're trying to test an observable that you want to set up? And let's say you seriously want to say, take all of these values with RxJS until three days from now. That's, that's a lot of dashes you're going to be putting in at 10 milliseconds a pop to get three days worth of, of dashes, right? Like that's, your unit test is going to be ridiculous. So we need, we need a way to kind of um, enable us to, to, to do longer running observables and, and also to do more fine tuned tests. So maybe multiple things happen in the same millisecond, but they need to happen in a particular order or they, they happen within nanoseconds of each other or something like that. So there, there are definite needs for uh, you know, a, a much more scalable version of the test scheduler than what we have as far as in terms of when you can schedule and how you can schedule. And then you know, there's questions about how we can do that and still have it be as ergonomic as the um, the ASCII art style marble diagrams, which are really nice because you can line them up vertically and it, and then your tests kind of make sense. Um, so that's that's something that's that's really high on the agenda. I, I know that there's teams around Netflix that are chomping at the bit to to get this and use it um, in a in a more ergonomic way than, than it currently exists. Uh, so the, the next really big thing on the agenda for RxJS is uh, there's a schedule, scheduling and error handling refactor. And I'll, I'll talk more about this at the Rx Contributor Day. However, um, the, 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 the short version of it is I was working with Brian Cavalier, who's the author of most JS, which is a great library. And Brian's a really nice guy. And kind of looking at uh, how error handling works in in most, and basically um, any error that happens, say if you have like a map function and there's an error that happens in there, uh, it, it you unwind the stack all the way all the way back to the root of where your observable is is kind of notifying, and that's the only place where there's any try catching. Uh, and right now, what's happening in RxJS is Everywhere that that you're giving us, um, everywhere you're giving us a, a like a user land function for something like a map operation or a flat map or something, we we have to wrap that in a try catch. So if there's any errors that happen in it, we can send it down the error channel. And everywhere you have a try catch, uh, it actually deoptimizes. So the the goal is to is to kind of take that and move it into our scheduling layer. And the nice thing about that is it provides for better node support. Because in a lot of situations, uh, or a lot of a lot of node developers that are running services, don't want try catching. They would rather 
like throw an error and just cause their process to immediately um, die or abort so they can get the uh, they get better visibility into what was happening in memory and uh, what line of code and all, all of that stuff with the core dump that comes from the node process crashing. So it will get some of those things. And also it, uh, the uh, pre preliminary work that I've done on this, it's looking like we'll have a lot smaller library as well because we won't have to check and have all this, these uh, try catching everywhere. So uh, the, the next thing to talk about is the TC39 proposal. So I, I work with Jafar Hussein, who's the current champion of the TC39 observable proposal. Um, you can actually find this at github.com slash TC39 slash, I think it's observable dash proposal. Um, it, you should go check out that org on GitHub anyways, the TC39 org, because all the proposals are on it, and it's, it's pretty interesting reading. Uh, but I, I work, again, ten, 10 feet away from the, the guy who's the champion of this, and ArxJS is, uh, you know, we're, we are, a lot of what's happening in the proposal is, uh, reflects things that we've learned uh, writing ArxJS 5, because ArxJS 5 was written to match the, proposal. And there's certain things uh, that are coming with the proposal that are going to change. For example, uh, there are, there, I mean, you have to go read the threads on it. it. It would get a little detailed or a little hard to explain. But there's things around uh, error handling. For example, like right now, if there's an error thrown in your next handler in RxJS, it will uh, throw globally. Uh, and the reason that's kind of strange is if, since observables can either be synchronous or asynchronous, if they're synchronous, that means you can put a try catch around block around your subscribe and actually catch an error that was thrown in your next handler. However, in the much more common case that your observable is asynchronous, try catch around that isn't going to do anything. Uh, and the other, the other aspect of that is in the synchronous case, if you're multicasting up above where your subscription is, that uh, thrown error will unwind the stack all the way back up to the for loop where the multicast is occurring, break the for loop, and stop notifying all the other consumers of your multicast observable. So basically, that means I could have an observable that's multicast. I could hand it to three different third party consumers. And if any one of them does something bad, then the other ones stop getting notified and they have no idea why. So that's. And that's actually a bug that I've seen uh, rear its ugly head at, at Netflix. So there's, there's changes in the TC39 proposal to prevent that uh, around kind of like an error trapping type behavior. Uh, and which is funny because I think I've, I've kind of uh, loathed that, that behavior in the past with promises, but it's because promises are, are multicast. Um, so, but more on that uh, at the contributors days as well, uh, when there's a little bit more time to speak about it. Um, so and this is this is kind of the last thing. I, I really want to remind people that ArxJS is going to adhere strictly to Sember. So semantic versioning, if we add a new feature, that means we go out by a minor release. If there's any breaking change at all, no matter how small, we're going to do a major version change release. Uh, and the reason for this is, is if someone is using Node.js to, Im to import all of their dependencies and RxJS is one of their dependencies. Uh, generally, people do it with like either um, a caret and then you know there'll be like 5.0.1 or whatever version they, they started with. Uh, if they're using a caret, you know, and we have a patch release, so bug fixes, they'll get that change. At least I think it's a caret. Maybe it's a tilde. I get that, I get that backwards all the time. Uh, they'll get that change, uh, generally speaking, um, with the default way that, that NPM installs, they'll get bug fix changes, but they won't necessarily get new features uh, like in, in another version, because they may not want that, right? Uh, and they definitely will not get major release, uh, which would be going from Rx5 to Rx6, where there might be some breaking change. And again, it, it, no matter how small it is, I mean, maybe there's some edge case on some operator, and we change it, but it is a breaking change for somebody. That means we're at RxJS six, even though you know we changed we changed one a behavior on one kind of esoteric operator. It doesn't matter. Um, that's that's the way we're we're getting at. So we could be at uh, RxJS six or seven by the end of the year, um, or perhaps higher. It, it it really depends if if there are other breaking changes we need. Uh, 
However, I think the plan is that if we do have changes that are breaking, especially ones that are are particularly nasty, if they're small breaking changes, we might just go ahead and do the, the next major release because it, it shouldn't be things that impact a lot of people. If there's a breaking change that impacts a lot of people, uh, we'll likely make sure that we give out deprecation warnings in the, in the, de in the dev build of Rx it, for at least one major version before we go through and, and uh, clear that out. So that way, or, or remove that thing or whatever it is or, or change that behavior. So that way people aren't uh, broken in a way that um, is really time consuming to fix and they don't have a chance to upgrade. Hey there, are you into reactive programming using JavaScript? Do you have to deal with asynchrony in your web app? Then join this dot instructor Ben Lesh to learn all of the ins and outs of RxJS in his hands-on workshop. The next Rx workshop will be held in Silicon Valley on March 3rd and online April 13th. Go to rxworkshop.com for more details and to reserve your spot.